Hey y'all, it's Dr. D. It's great to see everybody. I uh, hope you're well. Uh, and I hope you've been following along with our confidence interval series. Uh, we started with the intuition of confidence intervals. Uh, we did a numerical example, the intuitive but uh, inefficient way. Uh, last time we talked, uh, we looked at uh, using just the symbols to work our way through, getting it through once. And doing, in so doing, we generated uh, some powerful formulas for confidence intervals. Um, and we earned it, right? We, we did the work to show that when you do this, mu1 comma mu2 equals x bar plus or minus z alpha um, different books might have different notation for that but it's the z you get when you do the process uh, times sigma x bar that this is actually two um two z score formulas kind of mushed together and that's what gives us our lower bound and our upper bound we also noted that this thing is called the margin of error uh, and we also noted one other formulation of this which is uh, x bar plus or minus z subscript alpha times sigma x over the square root of n now this works really well, uh, and it'll get you answers. It'll help you find out what the bounds are, uh, with one exception. Um, we had three terrible assumptions. One is that x is normally distributed. That's bad. We got rid of that by moving on to sampling. Started dealing with x bar and p bar. The second was mu is known. And we got rid of that by looking at confidence intervals. And we'll look at another application of it later. Uh, the last one is that sigma x is known. and uh, if it's not, if we get rid of that one, then what are we going to do? Panic. Uh, no, we're not going to panic. We're going to try to find a, a workaround, a, a solution. Uh, if mu x is known, then this still is true. It's just not useful because we don't know that, right? And so we can't calculate this. So that's gone. So we can't calculate the margin of error. So that's gone. So we can't calculate this stuff. So what could we do? How do we resolve this problem? Well, it turns out that there's always a standard deviation we can use. So we can estimate sigma x, which is, if you recall, the population standard deviation. That's why we don't know it generally. It's because it would require being able to observe every element in the population with s, which is our sample standard deviation. Now, because this is a sample standard deviation, it's a random variable. There is only one population standard deviation. It's the population standard deviation because the population contains everybody. So there's only one group that contains everybody. Whereas samples, there are lots of them. So when we collect a sample and find a sample standard deviation, that is just one of many possible standard deviations we could have calculated from our group, which means that this is an additional source of noise, of randomness. That means that when we are um, saying how confident we are, um, we are going to need to expand our bounds a little bit. Uh, it would be really unfortunate for us if we had to figure out just how uh, far to do that on our own. But fortunately, uh, a, uh, a statistician, statistical theorist who worked for the Guinness Brewing Company many, many years ago, uh, who published pseudonymously under the name A Student of Statistics, uh, discovered the uh, distribution that we would need. And so... The answer to what are we going to do is instead of uh, using sigma, we're going to use uh, s, but instead of z, we're going to use t. So we're, we're sigma's out, s is in, z is out, t is in. What do I mean by this? Well, there's a type of a class of distributions. So we've spent a lot of time talking about the normal distribution, but there's another distribution called the students t distribution now the students t that we're going to be using um, should look pretty familiar because uh, it looks more or less like this should look familiar it's still symmetrical still centered at zero um, but instead of z we put t here it does have a mean of zero and we don't actually typify it by its standard deviation instead uh, the t distribution, well, let's name a few things. It still has a total area of 1. That's true for every continuous probability distribution. It's still symmetrical. That is not true of every continuous probability distribution. Uh, unlike being um, typified by its two parameters, it is indexed by what are called degrees of freedom, which I will generally abbreviate df. And so we would put a little t here, and then we would put the number of degrees of freedom here. So maybe um, uh, 182 is, you know, could be the number of degrees of freedom, or it could be a different number. 
Uh, and depending on the application, those degrees of freedom are going to vary. Um, but with fewer degrees of freedom, essentially what happens is you get more noise. So for example, if we had like one or two degrees of freedom, it looks like this, where you got big, you know, the tails have a lot of the un uncertainty, right? It's capturing the fact that there's a lot of uncertainty. And then as you get further and further along, if you get to like T equals a, a million degrees of freedom, not T, degrees of freedom equals a million. Eventually, as well, another way to say this as is as d degrees of freedom approaches infinity, t approaches z. So it moves in that direction, right? It gets closer and closer. So it's kind of you can kind of think of this as like a copy of a copy of a copy of a z distribution, right? Where it's off by a little bit, and the the fewer degrees of freedom you have, the more off it is. Um, so that hopefully that helps uh, kind of wrap your head around what a t distribution is just a different probability distribution so it's a shape that has the weight placed in different places compared to a z distribution but it's similar in the sense that it's it's clearly related uh, these degrees of freedom have to be uh, integers by the way so we'll never put if, we, if you put a decimal in excel it'll know to turn into an integer the reason for that if you're interested is that embedded in the formula for a t distribution is uh, factorial i don't know if you remember factorial but like five factorial is five times four times three times two times one um, and factorials have to take integers as their arguments. Um, so that's why it's uh, always going to be uh, an integer. Um, if we want to use the t distribution, what we could do, by the way, to, to, to uh, do a confidence interval, is we could do the same exact thing we did before, right? What we could do is we could give ourselves uh, an x bar and then draw two curves and then relate it to the t distribution instead of the z distribution do it twice and then we um, we would have a t-score formula right you can do a t-score formula just looks like this but instead of sigma x over it's s over the square root of n that's a t-score and then we could do the algebra t times s over the square root of n subtract x bar we could do that all over if we wanted to but it would be the it would be identical right we would have the we we would have the same process um, and in the end we would get confidence interval formulas that uh, look very familiar to us, right? So um, just like before, so if sigma is known, then what we would have is mu1 comma mu2 equals x bar plus or minus uh, z alpha times sigma x over the square root of n. If sigma is unknown, can calculate bounds very similarly mu1 comma mu2 equals x bar plus or minus t subscript alpha times s over the square root of n where our standard error before we used the um uh, the standard deviation of the population now we're using the estimated value the sample standard deviation to account for that instead of using a z statistic we're going to be using a t statistic so this is a z statistic for the confidence interval, and this is a t-statistic. Now, everything here I feel very confident you can do, except for the t. So let's talk. X bar is given. S is usually given. Remember, it's called the sample standard deviation, so you find that in the question. Um, N is the sample size. So the, the real question is, how do we find t? Well, we're not going to do it by hand. We're going to do it just like we've done in the past with norm. Um, over here, we learn two formulas, norm.s.dist, and then in here we put the area to the left. Oh, sorry. Uh, is that right? No, norm.s.dist, we put z, comma, 1, and that would take z, and it would give us an area to the left. And then we had norm.s.inv, and then here we put the area to the left, My spacing is not great. Area to the left. And then that takes an area to the left. And it gives us a Z. Excel also has formulas for the T distribution. We got T dot dist. And now we're going to need T and then degrees of freedom and then 1. Because we do have to tell it how many degrees of freedom it is. Um, and in this case, when we're dealing with this, T alpha is going to have degrees of freedom equal to n 
minus one. That's important. When we want to find our degrees of freedom in this application, and there will be other ones, uh, but the degrees of freedom in this application is n minus one. Um, that is the curve we're trying to draw from. So depending on our sample size, uh, it accounts for how much uncertainty we kind of have in the t distribution. So t degrees of freedom comma one. Let me double check that. I'm pretty sure that's right, but let's see. Equals t dot dist. Yep, x deg freedom cumulative. So our x is our t there, degrees of freedom, and one. And that'll take our t and our degrees of freedom, and it gives us an area to the left. And then similarly, t t dot inv. Um, and then in here, we'll give it an area to the left and a degrees of freedom. What's the order for these? Area and then degrees of freedom. So area to the left. And then that'll spit out our T. And again, we're going to use N minus 1 for both of these degrees. Okay, so that's just going to be part of this calculating the margin of error. Uh, but other than that, it looks very similar. So let's take a look at the numerical example we've been working with for a little while, um, just to kind of show what it looks like. So uh, let's uh, maybe insert here, give ourselves a little bit of label. This was the, the long way, sigma known, the short way, sigma, and now we're going to do sigma unknown. So again, what we're going to do is just kind of copy this stuff over just the, the data we would get from the problem. Now, in this case, the question gave us sigma x, but imagine if instead it just gave us s. No, just gave us s. If that were the sample standard deviation instead of the population standard deviation, but everything else were the same, then what we would need to do first is find our t alpha, and then we could find our margin of error, and then we could find our lower bound and our upper bound. So our degrees of freedom, uh, we just established that that's going to be n minus 1. So in this case, we have 199 degrees of freedom. Um, just going to find the formula again. Oh, there it is, it's right there. And then my t alpha is going to be t dot inv, the area to the left. Now, um, the area to the left is going to be the same as it was before, right? It's still going to be alpha plus... 1 minus alpha divided by 2. I forgot the degrees of freedom. Sure enough, there we go. Why does this work? Well, let's look at what we did before. To find the area to the left of the t, um, let's look at it. We're going to have our t distribution. In this case, it has 199 degrees of freedom. Um, we've got a mean at 0. And then our t alpha is over here, right? That's um, it would correspond to you know the far end of the uh, middle 95 percent, the size of this area, and so we would have to find that. That's going to be 95 percent plus 0 0.025, which is this tail over here. So that's where that comes from. Our margin of error then is going to be um, the formula up here said it's t times s over n, or square root of n. So equals t times s divided by the square root of n. Now let me give you these formulas. And then our lower bound is going to be x bar minus mu o. And our upper bound is going to be x bar plus margin of error. And so that's how you find these. <clears throat> okay, now taking a look at what the process is, let's see what's different. Um, our margin of error, you can see, got a little bit wider. It's because um, our alpha got a little bit wider, right? Our t alpha got a little bit wider. Everything else stayed the same. S stayed the same, n stayed the same. But because of the, the tails are a little bit heavier on the ends, um, you have to push out a little bit to capture the middle 95%. So the t goes out a little bit more. Now that's true because um, it's, it only moves a little bit because we actually, 200 is a pretty large sample. I know when you're thinking about estimating millions of things, 200 doesn't seem like a lot. Um, but 200, 200 is pretty good in terms of uh, how large a sample that is. Um, but we can play around a little bit. These 200s um, are from all, all drawn from this number. So I want to draw your attention to, um, to this stack of numbers right here and this stack of numbers 
uh, right here, I suppose. I'm going to play with this uh, with this um, sample size and see what happens. Let's say that instead of 200, we had 20,000 people. Now you can see that they, uh, they're they really close, right? In fact, the estimates, the, the mu's here are identical. So if we have a large enough sample, then in fact, not knowing the true population standard deviation uh, has no visible effect down to that third uh, decimal. Um, if we had 2,000, uh, now you can see a little bit of difference, but it's really pretty small. What if we go down to like 20? Well, if you go down to 20, then you start to see bigger differences, right? Instead of 1.96, now we're talking about 2.09. Our margin of error, essentially, um, and you know, you can think about this ratio. The margin of error is essentially 6.7% higher here because of the uh, because of the small sample size and having to use t. Um, and if we go to 20 or 200, it gets smaller. If we go to 20,000, it's essentially identical. If we go to 15, it starts to get bigger and bigger, right? So the fewer, um, the smaller the sample size you have, um, the, the higher that is. That said, the T distribution is good even with pretty small sample sizes. So uh, when in doubt, if you know you have a small sample size, you can't really be confident you have a normal distribution, but the T allows for a little bit more uncertainty. So it's a, it's a good uh, standby. Okay, so that was the original problem. Uh, you can see there's a, you know less than half a percent of, uh, or a little more than half a percent difference between sigma known and sigma unknown. Um, and, but now this number right here, these numbers right here, you could actually calculate these numbers, um, because S you can calculate from a sample, uh, X bar you can calculate from a sample and you can calculate from a sample. Alpha is just an assumption, right? We make a, we're, we assert, or that's the question. We're framing the question of what are we trying to find here? Um, and if we, if we frame it that way, uh, all of these numbers are things you can go out and count today. So all of the rest of this stuff, you can go make your own confidence intervals at your leisure, uh, as you see fit. I hope you found this useful. Um, I, I think the, the using the t-distribution is one of the most valuable things that there is to know how to do in statistics. Um, and so I'm glad that I got to introduce you to these two new formulas, t.dist and t.inv. Uh, we'll continue to use them very frequently. And um, I should say t, the t-distribution is probably the most important uh, distribution in statistics. So we've been playing with the normal distribution for a while. It has a lot of really nice properties. Um, but in the world as we actually see it, where we're dealing with samples instead of dealing with populations, uh, the t-distribution is uh, it's the, the workhorse of our uh, statistical modeling. So we have uh, finished getting rid of all three terrible assumptions. Um, I'll post some videos showing walkthroughs for some of the practice problems for the problem set. Um, but next time you see us, you know, next time we meet to talk about uh, concepts, we're going to look at if you don't know mu and sigma again, we're going to um, look at another path, right? How do we move forward if we're not trying to estimate mu, but instead trying to make a decision or try to say something uh, true about the world. Um, so I'll see you guys there. I uh, hope you have uh, a Easy time with all of the practice problems. If you get stuck on anything, please get in touch. I'm here to help. Thanks. See you.